to you. Good morning and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers. I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session. We're going to be talking about physical activity, and this is the second in our series on our health is our wealth for caregivers. So before we get started, let me introduce Lucy and Elliot to you. Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar is a public health professional focused on supporting the health of the public through academic work, research, and service. He has led aging programs for seniors and for caregivers in Canada, Florida, and virtually. Dr. Sklar is an associate professor of healthcare science at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. He publishes and presents his work internationally, which is focused on the complexity of issues related to aging and caregiving. And now Lucy. Lucy Berlick received her master's degree in social work from McGill University and has dedicated her career to supporting caregivers. Lucy was the founder and long-term care manager of the Caregiver Support Center at a respite program for family caregivers. There she oversaw multidisciplinary training across caregiving, mental health, elder abuse, and palliative care. In 2003 and also in 2012, she received the Queen's Jubilee Award presented by the Canadian Home Care Association, awarded for her dedication in development of a national coalition to support the issues and challenges facing informal caregivers. Lucy also co-edited a book for healthcare professionals entitled Responding Creatively to the Needs of Caregivers. She's been a key architect of screening and assessment tools of family caregivers, for which she provides training and help to healthcare professionals across North America. Lucy consults for private industry, including WellMed Charitable Foundation and clinics in Texas, Additionally, Lucy is a liaison supervisor at the School of Social Work at McGill University, where she currently supervises 20 interns. She was also a caregiver for her mother for about 10 years. Welcome, Lucy and Elliot. Thank you so much, and welcome to all of our participants. So we have a couple of disclaimers, and I have a question for our audience um, before we begin our formal presentation but always consult with your doctor before starting any new exercise program. Uh, we have a unique presentation today and we're actually gonna go through a number of different ways that you can exercise with different health conditions for yourself or with a caregiver, um, I'm sorry, a care recipient. So it is important that of course you discuss this with the doctor first. Now, I also wanted to just ask uh, the audience if anyone can tell me, and you can enter this in the chat or you can unmute yourself, what physical therapy is or what it involves? Anyone? Has anyone had physical therapy before? I have, sometimes called physiotherapy. So what does it involve? Anyone remember their experience? I had a couple. I had two car wrecks, and um, I think they were trying to get me back to where I was, but my body back to where I was before my car wreck. And right. how did they? Do, how did they do that, Dorothy? Well, we had to exercise. We had to do several <laughs> exercises. There you go. And good to see you back with us. I hope things yes. are well. So you're completely right. Physical therapy is a medical treatment that aims to restore functional movement, to ease pain, to help you function, move, and live better. And it does include guided exercise um, and also sometimes massage or different treatment like heat, things like that. So I want everyone to keep that in mind as we're talking today, because to me, physical activity is really the same as physical therapy, and that's how I see it for my own self. My last disclaimer here is that I was the person picked last in gym class. So 30 years ago, if you told me that I would be such an advocate for physical activity, I would not have believed you. I have lived firsthand the benefits of physical activity. I also very much appreciate people's apprehension about engaging in exercise. 
So I understand these things and we're here to talk today. Uh, we will have some time after our program as well if you wanna talk more anonymously, but we welcome your participation, your questions. And Lucy and I are really excited to be facilitating today's program about really the importance of physical activity for caregivers and also for care recipients. And we have a lot of different tips today that we'll uh, be including for things you can do with your care recipient. And as always, we will provide a copy of our handout. Um, but if you think about it, we see so many ads on TV for medication, but I've never seen an ad on TV that promotes physical activity to improve our health and our well being. And if you think about that, it's because physical activity is free. Nobody stands to gain from it more than you do in terms of your own health and well being. Exercise is proven to help our mental health, our immune health, our cardiovascular and muscular health. It's proven to help ward off illness and certain health conditions. Yet I never heard anyone saying anything about exercise or eating right as a way to help support our own health. And it's so important. Hi, you're absolutely right, Elliot. It is so important. And as you said, I think it's so important to keep in mind, starting any exercise program or routine, uh, you really need to speak with your doctor or specialist. You know, physical therapy, for example, as Elliot was talking about, it can be ideal in helping a person with certain restrictions or health issues get started uh, focusing on exercise routine that is best for your body and health. You know, certain health plans also cover uh, fitness programs, so it's important to check with your doctor and your insurance. Another good place to, to start today is also to remind everyone that when we're talking about exercise, we're not necessarily suggesting that you run a marathon. Stretching is such an important and overlooked part of what should be our daily routine. Stretching is important as we age, and there are forms of exercise like Tai Chi, which focuses on flow and movement and don't cause you to break a sweat. There's also things you could do in bed and even using a tennis ball to roll against can help to massage and stretch out our muscles. Stretching is a great place to start and there are online videos for free almost everywhere that you can benefit from. And on a personal level, I have to tell you, Every morning in bed, I start doing my stretching. And um, I it just is it's such a good feeling that when you start to stretch, I feel like I'm really, really um able to start moving. Yeah. Um ahead of the hour we were talking about my new puppy. And uh when he gets up in the morning, he stretches. And, yeah. you know, he's only a few weeks, but that's just something that's natural to him. And I think for many of us, we've sort of become a little disconnected from our bodies. And what you're talking about, that art of just getting in the habit of stretching every day or doing something to help your movement is very important. What I really want to emphasize for everyone is that you have to find what works for you. Because the only way that you can make a habit of something is if you enjoy it or if you reap a benefit from it. I'm lucky, I actually really enjoy exercise. Um, to me, it's a daily reminder that if I can get through 30 minutes on the elliptical, I can get through anything that the day has in store for me. It helps to clear my mind. Uh, often if I'm going through a hard time, I'll take a bike ride or a walk outside. I notice a difference in my mental health, but also I've seen a difference in my physical health, lower blood pressure, A1C, glucose, cholesterol, triglycerides, less knee pain, better balance, and I can keep going, better sleep. We wanted to share some benefits of exercise. And I was saying that we were making our program today focus on certain uh, health issues or certain types of diseases and the benefits of exercise for your care recipient, um, but also potentially for yourself. Now, as you age, you may have some concerns about increasing risk of dementia. And a lot of people over the years have asked us what we can do to help prevent it. Um, earlier this year, I gave a talk on a new medication that was just released for Alzheimer's. 
And I talked about the fact that we have a lot of clinical trials because it's a medication that costs a lot of money, but we don't have the same evidence from exercise and the way that exercise can help to prevent or reduce symptoms of cognitive impairment. So as the number of older adults is rising, so are the number of people with dementia. And some studies have shown that increased rates of dementia, meaning new cases in the population over a period of time, have also decreased in certain locations in the United States. And it's interesting, based upon some of these studies, factors such as healthy lifestyle behaviors, higher level of education, interestingly, may be contributing to declines in certain areas. But cause and effect is uncertain. So what has been shown, however, in a review of published literature, so this looks at all of the evidence that comes before it to make it a very powerful study. And what was shown was certain behaviors that help to reduce or prevent de or delay Alzheimer's and age-related cognitive decline. And the review found what they considered to be encouraging but inconclusive evidence, and I'll explain why, for three types of behavioral changes or interventions. Those included physical activity, blood pressure control through physical activity, and also cognitive training, which is like doing crossword puzzles, math games, stuff like that. Now, why was the evidence encouraging but inconclusive? Because of the number of participants. When you have a large clinical trial for a medication, People are usually compensated or want to go on the medication and they get it for free, so they might then participate. When you have studies like this where there's no, no one benefiting, uh, there's no monetary incentive for anyone, it's harder to find participants. So we need more participants and more research to show that this is actually conclusive, but it's very encouraging, which is important. And there's other research that I've mentioned uh, during our programs previously about men who use Viagra regularly and that they have a lower incidence of developing dementia or Alzheimer's, which researchers are looking into. Now, what we know about Viagra is that it increases blood flow in the body. And if you think about that, that's very similar to what exercise does. So I would be very interested to learn more about this because I think personally that there is a link there and I think some encouraging um, reasons for us to be exercising through the life course if we can. Now, um, I would love Lucy to talk a bit about stroke because this is also so important. Yes. You know, strokes can be extremely serious. According to CDC, one in six deaths from cardiovascular disease in 2020 was due to a stroke. Furthermore, every 40 seconds, someone in the US has a stroke and every 3.5 minutes, someone dies of a stroke. Vacuuming, mopping, walking a pet or playing catch may be enough activity to avoid a stroke. That's mm -hmm. extremely interesting and valuable to kind of keep in mind. Doctors found that daily household chores can significantly reduce the risk of a stroke a new study from San Diego University published in the Journal of American Medical Association found that doing lighter daily activities such as household chores can significantly reduce the risk of a stroke. This research measured both the amount of time participants were sitting and the duration and intensity of physical activities in 7,600 adults ages 45 and older, and then compared the data to the incident of strokes and participants over seven years. So that's a lot, you know, that's really valuable to kind of keep in mind. They found those were um, inactive for 13 hours or more, they had a 44% increased risk of having a stroke. So research found, uh, you know, so research across the board has shown that caregiving can have a negative impact about the health of uh, caregivers. And we know that, and we talk a lot about it. And yet exercise is rarely made a focus of something that caregivers can in fact do to help manage their level of stress and to improve upon their health. So let's look at, so here are a few things that we really should be uh, 
looking at. So according to the Family Caregivers Alliance, about one in 10, that's 11% of caregivers report that caregiving has caused their physical health to get worse. Caregivers also report chronic conditions, including heart attack, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and arthritis at nearly twice the rate of non-caregivers. That's 45% um, uh, to 24%. Caregivers suffer from increased rates of physical ailments, including acid reflex, headaches, pain, aches, increased tendency to develop serious illnesses and have a high levels of obesity and bodily aches and pains. The physical stress of caregiving can affect the physical health of the caregivers, especially when providing care for someone who cannot transfer themselves out of bed, uh, walk or bathe without assistance. 10% of primary caregivers report that they are physically strained. As well, caregivers have lower levels of self-care. You know, a lot of them, and in all of our sessions, we talk about caregivers need to take, you need to take care of yourselves. Um, caregivers are less likely to engage in preventive health behavior, which one of them is actually exercise. So caregiver self-help, self-care suffers because they lack the time, the energy to prepare proper meals or to exercise. About six in 10 caregivers in a national survey reported that they're eating 63% and exercising 58% habits are worsened uh, than before. Okay, so even though they might have been doing these things before, since they became caregivers, they really have stopped. So despite all that we know, there's very little talk about the importance of encouraging exercise for caregivers which is a natural antidote to stress, depression, anxiety, and chronic health conditions, and we know that. So I just wanna share with you on a personal level, uh, besides walking, I dance every single day. I put on music that I like, and that relieves my stress. And while I'm dancing around my living room, I have to tell you the sense of feeling so much better. So as Elliot and I wanna point out, you don't have to join a gym, you don't have, you know, it could be as simply as putting on some music and dancing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wanted to see if anyone has any thoughts about what you shared about caregiver physical health, uh, or if anyone has any comments about exercise, anything that's helped them, any challenges. Are all of our participants getting 150 minutes of exercise a week as recommended? <laughs> you know, I think, Elliot, one of the biggest challenges why people don't do a little bit of exercise is just the motivation factor of um, just doing it and starting it. I think it's so important to keep exercise, whatever means it is, and st or stretching, as part of your daily routine. No different that, you know, you eat three meals a day, you drink a certain amount of water, you go to the bathroom, you bathe, you shower, you whatever. So it has to be part of your schedule, part of your daily routine to include it, whether it's 10 minutes or 15, right, Elliot? It doesn't have to be an hour. Uh, nope. It is so, so helpful. Research actually shows that 11 minutes a day has a positive impact. So it doesn't have to be much at all. And as we were saying before, I really believe that in order to make something a habit, you either have to get something from it, and that could be joy, or that can be a benefit to your health, or a relief of pain, what have you. So, you know, find something that works for you, and that's going to be different for everyone. That's why we're providing a lot of different options and resources during our talk today. One of them is actually a program uh, called Silver Sneakers. And I was curious if anyone participating today has ever heard of Silver Sneakers. If you have, you can raise your hand or say something in the chat box. So for those of you who know or who don't know, Silver Sneakers is an exercise program that has actually been around for a very long time. And there are more participating Silver Sneakers fitness locations 
across the country than there are Starbucks locations. Many people don't know that, um, but it's, it's actually quite amazing the breadth of partners in terms of options now. Uh, in fact, yeah, uh, Monday I was in a Pilates class and uh, the lady on the carriage next to me was telling me that she's 68 and that she loves Pilates because in addition, she gets it for free through Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, and our Pilates studio, which is called Club Pilates, is a national chain and she's a snowbird. So she spends um, the winters here and her summer is up north and she's able to continue her free program. So there are options really for anyone nowadays, including things you can do at home too. Um, Silver Sneakers actually also has a customizable app now that you can uh, download onto your iPhone or smartphone. Um, and it allows you to see all of the different partners and classes available in your local community. Uh, you can also call 211 in your community to learn more or visit the website at the bottom of our screen. Um, we will be sharing, as I said, a copy of our handouts, but there are over 15,000 uh, fitness locations that are partnered with Silver Sneakers. And if you are medical, uh, Medicare eligible, rather, um, usually Medicare plans offer this fitness and wellness program at no cost. So it's important to look into it and see what might be available to you. Uh, I belong to a gym and to a Pilates studio. Both actually are Silver Sneakers programs. Um, and it's great to see how many seniors in our community are working out at all different times of the day, doing all different things. Um, one of the nice things too, is that many of these partner um, facilities will have uh, classes in person that are designed for uh, seniors and those that might have certain physical limitations. Uh, for example, my gym also has a Pilates class for seniors. So lots of options. And if you visit the link below, you can explore them. Um, in addition, I'm having a little issue today with my slides. Um, there's also, see, I didn't even huh. click on anything. And uh, just give me, whoops. Hold on. So the video here that you see that you cannot hear um, is a video from the National Institute on Aging. And they have a number of YouTube videos that are free. You can access them using the link on our screen. Uh, and if you scroll to the bottom of their YouTube site, they have a number of free instructional videos specifically designed for seniors that focus on balance, stretching and mobility that you can do from home. Uh, they also have a great number of 15 minute workout videos, which I really like, uh, including those that you can do from a chair, um, et cetera. So I apologize that the slides are moving around a little funny today, but I think it's because of the embedded video. Um, the thing that I really wanted to talk about that I alluded to a little earlier as someone who has picked last in gym class um, is that really, Anyone at any age can do physical activity. A lot of people who are heavier feel a little uncomfortable going to the gym, um, maybe that they don't fit in or that they don't belong there. And I understand how those things feel. That's actually why there was a, a chain of gyms for women uh, years ago called Curbs that was specifically designed as a more welcoming environment for women and for women who might have felt uncomfortable in, um, in your more traditional type of a gym. So I, oh, Minerva said I missed curves. Yeah, a lot, that chain, it's crazy to me that they went um, bankrupt, but, you know, I think fitness trends evolve. Right now, it seems like we're going through a new evolution and a lot of people are doing things at home, uh, which was really spawned by the pandemic because now you can work out in the comfort of your own home and you can feel more comfortable. Um, but I really want to encourage people that if you have health conditions and if you are concerned about stigma, just you know try to work that out if you can, um, either through counseling, self-talk, talk with friends. Um, maybe you need a little encouragement and can engage in some activity with someone, even as I was saying, care recipients can benefit from physical activity, but things like walking, riding a bike, swimming, weightlifting, gardening, these are all typically safe things to do, especially if you build up slowly. 
again, always speak with your doctor. But uh, one of the reasons, as Lucy was saying before, I think a lot of people shy away from exercise because they feel like they don't have the time or they don't have the motivation, as Lucy said. Sometimes we don't have the motivation because we feel a sense of stigma. And that is a significant barrier, uh, especially for people who come from different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds, also with gender stigma. There's, uh, if, if you think of physical activity, years ago it used to be bodybuilders, you know, the Arnold Schwarzeneggers of the world. That's changed completely. And for many people who haven't been to a gym in a long time, um, you know, there's a, a, a challenge in just getting a foot in the door. So it's another thing that you may want to consider is a lot of gyms offer free guest passes. And before joining one, if you are interested, you should sample a couple of different gyms in your area, also at different times of the day that work for you. So you can see the type of people that are there, what classes they offer. Um, I was saying that I love going to my gym because there are a lot of people from all different age groups, uh, all different sizes. I think it is inspiring and motivating for me. Um, and the way that I see it is, um, every day that I work out, I'm hopefully adding a day of good health to my life. I feel better. Um, and that also helps with some of the stigma and the mental health issues that go with the barrier to exercising. So sometimes you just got to do it and see how you feel. Um, and also for people who have um, financial barriers and so on, there are different opportunities, like we were saying, for physical activity anywhere. You can take a walk. You can get free class passes to places. Um, there's also Planet Fitness now, which offers uh, gym memberships for $10 a month. So I think that there's really no reason why we should look at barriers anymore. We should try to find a way to move beyond them. And as Lucy was saying, I think that, you know, just starting out at home, even with stretching or something you can build into your daily routine is really important. So I wanted to invite our audience, if you have any um, tips on things that have been helpful to get you motivated to get a little activity into your life, or if you need some motivation. Go ahead, somebody raise their hand. Um, I think the person is muted. Vianca? Bianca, do you want to unmute yourself? Or did you have something you wanted to share? I think she might need some help. No problem. We'll come yeah. back to her. Okay. All right. I, I really want to talk. A, oh, she's coming back. Should we wait a minute? Or, uh... Sure. Okay. Hang on, everyone. Bianca is going to unmute and share something with us. There you go. There you go. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, Hi. I just want to say that I'm visually impaired. And so um, my motivation is, you know, I have glaucoma. And usually they say, you know, doing cardio uh, exercises um, gets oxygen, you know, to your optic nerves. And so that was a, sort of a motivation to do, you know, like cardio. You know, I do the elliptical. Um, I do, you know, aerobic exercise, you know, to uh, continue um, with that. And I still have, you know, some vision you know, so I like to try to keep that vision. So that's a big motivation for me. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And that's mm -hmm. great. Cardio is wonderful. And it does promote blood flow to everything in the body, which is very helpful. And also, it helps to relieve uh, blood pressure. And potentially, there is some research to show the benefit on glaucoma as well, which, as you know, is related to pressure in the eye. Mm -hmm. And you were speaking about the silver sneakers. I really take advantage of that myself. You know, I belong to two places. Yeah. So I do yoga at one place and then I do the aerobics and other um, activity. Uh, I will go to the gym and 
um, I have a service dog that goes with me and takes me to my, uh, my routine on my machines. That's fantastic. Good for you. You sound so motivated and taking some control. This is part of it, of your condition. Instead of just sitting back and, you know, and accepting it, you're doing something about it. So good for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. All right. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this research for sure <laughs> like the research i shared earlier researchers are assessing the benefits of exercise to delay mild cognitive impairment wow in older adults and to improve brain function in older adults who may be at risk for developing alzheimer's disease so older adults with um with mild cognitive impairment may be able to safely do more vigorous forms of exercise similar to older adults without MCI, providing they are, uh, there are no other underlying health concerns. Again, never start doing something without uh, first speaking to your doctor. But this is really exciting. So being active and getting exercise may help people with Alzheimer's or any other dementia to feel better and can help them to maintain a healthy weight and to have a regular bathroom and sleep habits. So if you are a caregiver, you can exercise together to make it more fun. And we always promote that. So let's look at some tips for a person with dementia to stay active. So obviously one of the simplest things and probably one of the most enjoyable when the weather is nice is to take a walk together each day. So exercise is good for both of you. Use exercise videos as Elias was talking about or check with your local TV guide to see if there is a program to help older adults exercise. There's so much. And this one, obviously, I love dance and music. It's available to you at home. You don't have to go anywhere. And what's nice about it is, you know, in different cultures, we have different music that we enjoy and you're exercising at the same time, you're getting a lot of joy from music. And we know that music is a universal language. Um, be realistic about how much activity can be done at one time. Don't overdo it, start very slow. As Elliot said, even 11 minutes, several short mini workouts may be best. Make sure that they wear comfortable clothes, shoes that fit well and are made for exercise. Make sure they uh, that they drink water or juice after exercise so they're not dehydrated. So even if the person has trouble walking, they may be able to do things um, without having to walk, simple tasks. Now, uh, I would say exercise in a chair for those who can do it. I use a stationary bike, but chair exercise is really very, very safe to do by lifting your legs, uh, twisting, you know, moving around your arms. The other thing that is also that you could use is soft rubber exercise balls or balloons for stretching or throwing back and forth. So you're actually engaging with that person. Not only are you exercising, but you're also having a good time um, and having an activity where you're not just a caregiver. You know, you're doing activities that you're sharing with the partner. Um, I love this one, using stretching uh, uh, bands. I mean, they're amazing. I mean, you can really, really use them and you don't, you go as far as you can go. If that's all you can do, that's all you can do. You, did, you know, slowly progress. Now this one also, light weights or household items and I use soup cans. <laughs> so it depends on that, the soup cans are easy to use. So, I mean, before we go any further, just wondering if somebody else has a tip that I've missed um, or any question that you may have that you would like to share with the rest of us. Okay. I love the uh, the balloon. Um, yeah. When I when I first started doing volunteer work in a senior's home, uh, I always used to have balloons and toss them around with people, and it's a great way to keep our um, our senses sharp, you know. Um, but it's a a very easy thing, and you know, balloons are easy to you know 
put in your pocket. You can blow them up when you go somewhere. It's, it's just a nice thing. Maybe. I also wanted to talk about exercising with arthritis, for which tossing a balloon can be very helpful as well. Um, people with arthritis, um, exercise is especially important because it actually can reduce joint pain and stiffness. It can also help with losing weight as well as we know, which puts stress on the joints. Now, flexibility exercises like stretching and Tai Chi are very important to keep the joints moving. Um, I always say that if I don't use my joints, I feel like the Tin Man exercises my oil. And so it's important to use exercise as a way of helping to lubricate the joints, flexibility exercises that can help to relieve stiffness and give you more freedom in your everyday activities. Um, most of us find it very hard, as an example, to bend down and touch our toes. Um, and that's okay, but it can take some practice and something, um, for example, that I've learned with Pilates um, is something that I do every day as my own home stretching routine now. It really helps my lower back. So um, strengthening exercises as well, like overhead arm raises, they can help to maintain or add muscle to protect your joints as well. While endurance exercises, um, those make the heart and the arteries healthier by lessening swelling in the joints again. So try activities that don't require a lot of heavy lifting uh, or a lot of uh, weight on the joints. Um, many people in my Pilates classes, as an example, have arthritis because you're doing the class laying down usually in a carriage. And so gravity um, is very helpful there. It takes the pressure off of the joints. Same thing with swimming as an example. And if you have arthritis, you may want to avoid certain things. For example, when your joints are swollen or inflamed. And this is important um, because if you have pain in a specific joint area, you may wanna reshift your focus for a couple of days or weeks until that area is feeling better. And different combinations of exercise can allow you to do that better. So that's very important, as is um, the importance of exercise for people with type 2 diabetes. And for people with diabetes, exercise and physical activity can certainly help to reduce your glucose and A1C, as I was saying, but also walking and other forms of exercise are very, very helpful. Uh, again, you don't need to go to a gym. A walk can actually help to reduce your glucose level. So it's important, again, to be consistent in what you're doing, to set a daily or weekly goal um, if you can. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be seven days out of the week, but it can be most of them. Again, fitting something into your life that is helpful that you can make a routine out of. And a healthcare team can also help you. Um, some other examples of things that you can do are to stretch during TV commercial breaks, uh, to walk around when you talk on the phone, or to take more steps by parking further away from stores. Um, these are just small things that you can do to increase more activity into your life. And uh, I want to just go back to one quick thing. Since we have the water bottle here and we were talking about using things at home, can anyone tell me? how much a, a normal uh, 500 milliliter, half a liter water bottle weighs if you're using it as a hand weight. It's a little trivia for you. I always like to recommend people use water bottles as hand weights because they're around. And then you can also remind yourself to drink water as you're exercising uh, and you have it handy. But um, one water bottle is roughly um, just under a pound. So uh, if you want to increase your weight, you can move up your water bottle size to a liter bottle and maybe eventually one and a half liters. But just a little bit of trivia. Thank you for that, Elliot. All these little tips are very helpful. I want to talk about something that's really important, exercise and heart health, okay? We all know that your heart keeps your body running. That's very important. As you go older, some changes in the heart and blood vessels are normal, but others are caused by disease. You know, choices you might make every day, such as eating healthy, maintaining healthy weight, and aiming to be more physically active can contribute to heart health. 
Inactive people are nearly twice as likely to develop heart disease as those who are active. A lack of physical activity can worsen other heart disease risk factors as well, such as blood cholesterol, um, all kinds of, of, um, of levels of, uh, of, of hormones in your body, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, pre-diabetes, being overweight and obesity, obesity, being physically active is one of the most important things you can do to keep your heart healthy. So according to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 60% of U.S. women do not engage in the recommended amount of physical activity. More than 25% of U.S. women are not active at all. And that's really very scary, especially if you're a caregiver. It isn't, and it, it's, you know, it's interesting that heart disease is so prevalent among older women. We used to think that heart disease was for men, but um, that's all changed now. So it's a real wake up call for women. Now, I also wanna talk about, so it, does anybody have a question about what I'm saying or a comment? I wanna give you that opportunity because this was very revealing for me, I have to say, as a woman. And there's certainly a link, I believe, between the fact that women are not getting the recommended amount of physical activity and the prevalence of heart disease. Okay. Yeah, so. absolutely. I All hope right. we're, we're giving you lots of uh, incentive to exercise. And maybe uh, people aren't really um, uh, engaging because you're just absorbing all that information because I have to tell you that happened to me as well as I was um, as we were developing this session. So let's look at exercise with osteo uh, osteoporosis. You know, weight bearing exercise is really important, which focuses uh, forces you to work against gravity, such as walking, jogging, or dancing three uh, to four times a week are best for building muscle and strengthening bones. Try some strengthening and balance exercise too to help and avoid falls, which can cause a broken bone. Doing these exercises is good for bone health, for people with uh, osteoporosis and those who want to prevent it. Now, I want to tell you, balancing is so, so important. I, you know, test yourself. Try to balance on one foot for 15 seconds without hanging on to anything. You might be surprised. And so that is an important thing that you need to develop and you can. So I do that every single mo uh, morning. I really do that and and I don't put a chair in in my you know I live in uh, in Montreal we have winters we have to change into boots I really push myself to put on my boots and take off my boots without sitting down or holding on Well I also think one of the things that has been helpful for me in Pilates is I was saying a lot of things are on a carriage some things are on a mat on the floor. And one of the ways to build balance, how you get up off of the floor. Uh, yes. And as, as we get older and our risk of falls increases, one of the other prevention things that I think is so important for physical activity is knowing how to get up if you fall. I know it sounds silly, but this is actually a very new thing that a lot of uh, clinicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists who deal with falls are trying to encourage that ahead of falling, try to practice getting down on the floor and seeing how you can get up. For many of us, it's not that easy. And it might let you know that you need to practice your balance or build certain muscle groups to help you. So it's very important for all people, not just people with osteoporosis, but we wanted to outline some of the major common health issues that people experience and things that exist that can help you uh, with those specific um, disease states, but also uh, the importance of exercise for different health issues. Now, I wanted to showcase uh, this device, which is um, something new, um, because again, I wanted to let everyone know you can exercise at any age and with any health issue. I have a cousin who is 92, 
and she was taking exercise classes ahead of the pandemic that were really helpful in getting her to be more mobile. And unfortunately, the pandemic really um, took away from that. And now she still doesn't feel very comfortable going to exercise classes. And she's uh, definitely experienced more issues with her mobility and also with neuropathy. Uh, at 92, she has a, a fibromyalgia, neuropathy, and she doesn't move her legs as much as she needs to. She uses a walker. So the device that I'm showing you here is a motorized power-assisted movement device for older people that you put your feet on and it actually moves for you. It helps to get you started. And once you are pedaling, it senses your resistance and it scales back on it so that you're doing more of the work. It also counts your number of steps or rotations. This is a, an example of a fancy one here on Amazon and there's a link to it below. Um, I don't advocate one brand or, or device over another. There are many of them that I think start out at about 20 bucks. The thing that I like about this is that you don't have to Velcro your feet into it, uh, which many um, pedals for under the desk uh, have you do. And the benefit here is that for someone who is perhaps 92, this is easier for her to use on her own without having to bend down or get someone to help uh, buckle her into it. So these are, you know, there are things out there for everyone. And I might add, since using this device for about a month, her um, circulation has improved and the fibromyalgia and neuropathy symptoms have lessened. So again, the benefit of movement. Um, I wanted to also talk about exercising with chronic pain um, because many of us encounter chronic pain and there are lots of things that we can do. Uh, for example, um, uh, it can actually help with pain management. Being inactive can actually lead to more pain and a loss of function. So again, it's important to speak with your doctor about engaging in exercise, not just to avoid potential uh, issues, but also if you may benefit from physical therapy and your insurance may cover it, it's a great way to get started and to get a customized workout plan and a routine that you can follow at home uh, covered by insurance. And it really, to me, it's kind of similar to personal training. That's why I wanted people to keep in mind the connection between physical activity and physical therapy, because to me, they're very, very deeply connected. And for different people, different exercises will have certain benefits. Um, we have a number of different tips here, but things like ice and heat can certainly help with chronic pain. Uh, same with massage different types of exercise. Um, we have some stretching examples here on the screen, but at, as Lucy was saying earlier, taking a tennis ball and massaging your back with it against a wall or a chair, that can be very helpful as well. Um, putting on extra weight can also slow healing and make pain worse. So again, it's important that we keep our bodies moving. You know, I believe a body in motion stays in motion. And um, I have seen that in my own experience working with caregivers. Uh, early in my career, I helped um, run a fall prevention program and also a chronic disease self-management program. And the people who participated who were more active had better health outcomes. Um, some of you may have seen this as well in your own life experience. So it's important to remember when you're exercising with pain that nothing goes away immediately. Um, ice or heat, as I said, can be helpful for immediate recovery or for um, specific issues, but exercise can help alleviate pain over time. And so it's important to be patient and to approach it slowly. And we have a number of different resources um, from a number of different health um, entities, uh, the American Physical Therapy Association, uh, the National Institutes on Aging, uh, the National Institute on Aging Fitness video that we included, Silver Sneakers, lots of good stuff here. Um, we also would encourage you to join us next week as we discuss uh, mental health uh, as our series is our health is our wealth. Mental health is critical in that. And so we have a very exciting program. Um, and I am sensitive to time. And Glenda, I know that you have 
some announcements and we can wrap up. And Lucy, I'm sure you have some concluding thoughts as well. Well, I have a little tip that I just would like to share for those of you who are bakers and have rolling pins. Mm. I have to tell you that my rolling pin really helps me stretch out my upper thighs. Um, ah. <laughs> oh, for sure. So, um, you know, again, don't do anything without asking your doctor first. But, you know, it rolls with you. It's easy to do. And it's amazing. Lucy, that is such a great tip. And I echo that. Um, I've had two um, knee surgeries. I've had two ACL repairs. Um, I've torn ligaments. And what happens if you're recovering from that and you're sitting for long periods of time, your IT bands, which is within your thigh, as you're saying, they get tight. And there's a certain rolling stick that physical therapists use, which is just like a, a oh, rolling yeah. pin. And it helps to lengthen out those IT bands. It provides such great relief. And a rolling pin does the same thing. And it's something you might have at home. We're big on that. So that's a tremendous tip, Lucy. Thank you. Really? Thank you, Lucy. Uh, my tip, <laughs> I have arthritis in my thumbs that bother me at some points in time. And so I play cards a few times a week. Shuffling those cards and using your thumbs has really helped that tremendously. So it's the little things that count, right? <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. And actually physical therapists for the arthritis in the hands would sometimes have you walk your hands up a wall and down a wall. So the, the shuffling of the deck of cards mimics that same motion with your hands. It's a great thing to do and something that's social. So I love that very, idea. Very. The other thing that I do kind of combines Lucy, because when I walk, if I don't have a partner to walk with, which I find very encouraging, you know, you're talking as you go along, I'll put on music and a peppy music so that I can walk to that, that sound of that music. So that kind of dancing, Lucy, sort of, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so that's combining the best of both worlds. Um, Lucy and Elliot talked about their session next week. That'll be next Wednesday at 10 o'clock, same time, same channel. Uh, tomorrow, Lucy's going to be back and I'll be back with you, Lucy, also. And she's going to be talking about long-term care and when is the right time and who decides. Boy, that's a big topic. That is a really big topic. And that's at 10 o'clock also. This afternoon, I'm going to be back with uh, Tam Cummings. We're going to do an Ask Dr. Tam session at 1 o'clock this afternoon. So I hope that you will join us for that if you're caring for someone with dementia or just have general questions about dementia. That's a wonderful session. Um, if you haven't received the calendar for October, I mean, it's jam-packed with a lot of information. So I hope that you will take advantage of that um, and go to our website because you will find that at the www.caregivertelesconnection.org website. If you ever have any difficulty uh, reaching podcasts, just questions about caregiving, you can call toll-free to our customer service representative, and that number is 866-390-6491. And what a wonderful month we're in, October, one of my favorites. Certainly. Um, and Minerva, thank you so much for posting the information um, in the chat box for people as well. And that's all I have for you today. Y'all are not doing your half hour follow up session today. We will stay on if anyone has any questions or comments. Um, but if anyone has any right now, we, we'd welcome them before we end our, our session. All right. Well, I thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Glenda and Minerva. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate you choosing to be with us on this hour. And I look forward to seeing you on future sessions. Bye, Elliot and Lucy. Bye, Glenda. Bye -bye. So much.